Hey everyone, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I am your host, Blake Morgan. Today, my guest is Kofi Amugadfried, the Chief Marketing Officer of DoorDash. Prior to being the first CMO ever of DoorDash, Kofi was the Vice President of Brand and Consumer Marketing at Facebook. Kofi was the recipient of Adweek's CMO Award in both 2021 and 2020. He was named Business Insider's List of 25 CMOs to Watch, and he also won a Brand Genius Award from Adweek. In the podcast episode, we are talking about his work at DoorDash, his vision for how to build a modern marketing strategy that's customer focused. And we talk about the neighborhood of good brand platform, the ad campaign and launch. It's his first campaign since becoming CMO of DoorDash and a campaign that showcases DoorDash as a force for good in empowering local economies. Please enjoy my interview with Kofi Amu Gottfried. Kofi, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast all the way from New Jersey. How's your day going so far? So far, so good. Thank you for having me, Blake. This is going to be fun. Yeah, so I'm so excited to interview you. You are DoorDash's first ever CMO. Your story is really, really unique. Um, The companies you've worked for, the strategies you've done, Can you introduce our audience to you, just the high level of how you came to work at some of the world's most beloved brands like Bacardi and Facebook and now DoorDash? Oh my God, where where do I even start? Um, (laughs) I'll I'll try and make this short and I'll start at the beginning. So I moved here when I was 17, um, you know, as a scholarship kid from from Ghana and I moved to St. Paul, Minnesota um, to go to college. And I thought I was going to be an econ major, but somewhere in there fell into an internship at Leo Burnett, my junior year in college. And I found this industry that I didn't even know existed at the time. Um, that was like a really interesting blend of, you know, I was like an econ guy. So I cared about the business outcomes, but also had like creativity and culture and understanding people and psychology. And these were all things that like fit together in the same business. And I almost couldn't believe it. It felt too good to be true. And so, Started my career there, worked at Burnett, um, spent some time at Wyden and Kennedy where I worked on the Nike business, um, then moved back to Ghana uh, to build a business for Publicis where I built an agency that, you know, operated uh, across 23 countries um, and then spent some time at Bacardi as the head of global brand. And I think what I've tried to do at each stop is just figure out a way to learn something new. Um, so each job I've had has been unlike the job I've had before um, and about building out a new skill set. So... Then from Bacardi, spent some time leading an agency in New York and then transitioned into into tech where I spent um, three and a half years at Facebook and then I've spent the past three and a half here at DoorDash. Um, But a lot of it has just been motivated by curiosity, by by learning, by trying to figure out net new things um, that I don't yet understand. So Kofi, one of the things that people love to say about Facebook is their strategy of move fast and break things. And for a company that you're at now where it's 6,000 employees, 5 billion in revenue, only nine years old, it seems like that strategy is very relevant. Can you just talk about your experience in the past few years being at this company at a time where you know, you've got a lot of curveballs, you've got the pandemic, you know, people are ordering food, the business is growing like crazy. What has that been like? Yeah, it's been it's been phenomenal. Um, one of the things that we talk about as a core value at DoorDash is this notion of having a bias for action. And the notion behind that is we believe that like your rate of your ability to like launch actions and experiment is like the number one predictor of success. So the sooner you can get things out in market, the sooner you can learn, the sooner you can iterate, the sooner you can improve um, and sort of get 1% better every day. So I'd say like in the past two years, I've seen us do that um, really well. So if you think about, you know, reverse back to March 2020, um, when we all got hit with this, uh, this, this global pandemic that we've now all come to know far too well. But at the time, we didn't have a clue what was really happening. No one understood like which way the business was going to go. All we understood in that moment was that we had to respond quickly for the benefit of our audiences. So you know, I think we were probably one of the first brands, not just in our space, but anywhere to roll out a campaign that was focused on the pandemic. And we launched this thing called Open for Delivery, which was about um, 
getting people to still continue to order in from restaurants to keep them open. Um, and that went from brief to air in six days. And it's like a really good example of having a bias for action. And then, of course, we launched a bunch of other things like built a PPE pipeline so that dashes could um, you know, get their personal protective equipment, um, you know, launched instant pay for restaurants so they could cash out because we knew how important it was um, that they were able to take cash out in a time like that. But I feel like in those moments, we launched dozens of new products and features all in record time. You know, we, we now all order today and it's contactless delivery. And if you think back, Blake, that wasn't a thing. Like in February, mm-hmm. 2019, you went to the door to meet the person who was delivering things. And so having to rewrite the entire app to enable contactless delivery, having to think about how do you give both the dasher and the customer instructions on what that means? How do you mitigate for the fact that things are more likely to go missing when there's not an in-person handoff? And these are all things that we had to figure out in a matter of days instead of having you know months to think about them. So a really delicate piece of what leaders do, especially when we think about customer experience, is how is using the language. Like how do we communicate these delicate things? And that is what I understand you are a complete expert at. What advice do you have for our listeners and viewers that want to be an expert communicator during times where you have to pivot quickly and think on your feet while remaining customer centric um, and doing it fast? So just any tips on language and how you can communicate these things when it's very delicate? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think for us, the thing that really helped us focus um, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, early on in, in, in 2020, we, we were hyper-focused. It's because we boiled all the initiatives we're doing, all the things we're doing around the company, and we boiled it down to like a really simple thing, which is like, how can we help? Like right now, what can we do? Um, like, what do dashes care about? Well, it turns out they care about safety. They care, they care about earnings. They care about being able to deliver. Um, what do merchants need? Well, they need to stay open. What do consumers need? They need more convenience than ever because they're stuck at home. And we try to, like, peg everyone's attention to, like, just getting really clear on, like, what do people need today? What do they need this week? What do they need next week? And, you know, generally, if you can keep bringing it back to a, a customer need, particularly in an environment of... Um, of urgency in an environment where the world is changing around all of us, um, chances are you're going to have the right answer. So getting people focused on that, those types of questions is what we found to be like a really useful communication device because everyone could go back to that, ask themselves that question, understand what they were hearing from their customers, and then act accordingly. I watched an interview you did, Kofi, with Gary Vaynerchuk, and you talked about the fact that today brands can't hide and avoid talking about some of the more pressing issues that are affecting society. And if they do, they're seen as part of the problem. And I've also read that you have this belief that brands only really matter as much as they solve problems for people. So the brand is now in this unique position where they're actually almost like a governmental force. They have to be political. They have to make a statement. Do you have any advice for our business people listening that want to do that? But again, they're also limited by bureaucracy and their their legal departments. Yeah, I think a big part of it for us is like find what is authentic to you. The reality is that like you cannot as a business speak out on everything that's happening in the world. That's like a massive distraction. Um, and not all the things that are matter that are happening are going to matter to like your core business. So what we've really tried to do is understand like our mission as DoorDash is to empower local economies. Fundamentally, like that comes down to providing access and providing opportunity. So we look at the way we speak out or more frankly act on social issues th- almost exclusively through that lens, which is like, if it's not about access or opportunity, we're likely not going to have a position on it. And mm-hmm. even if it is, we will only have a position on it if we believe that we're going to do something or already doing something through our core business practices, because it's really easy to put up an Instagram square. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't mean anything. Like, what have you actually done? And so we've really tried to index around like, what are ways that our business is providing access and opportunity? And what are things that we can build out into our business to encourage more of that in our business? Because then we feel like we have the right to speak on this because it's core to our DNA. It's core to who we are. It's not a side project. It's endemic to how we're building our business. So, you know, to give you like a couple of practical examples, you know, we've launched things like an accelerator for local goods, which says, you know, we're going to help um, trans women, people of color, immigrant owned entrepreneurs. We're trying to get a package good on the shelf for the first time. 
we're going to use our Dash Marts, which is our, our first party sort of grocery and convenience offering to guarantee them shelf space so they can bring net new products to market. We want to use our business in that way um, because that's about access. That's about opportunity for audiences that have historically um, not been supported in this way. And then, like, of course, we then are able to speak about that. But it starts first with like actually doing it in a real way through your business. So speaking of doing good, let's talk about this new um, giving campaign that you are working on. Let's talk about Neighborhood of Good and what that campaign is and, and how we can get involved and help. Yeah, for sure. So I, I think, you know, we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, our, our mission from the beginning has been about empowering local economies. And so the thing that we really wanted to do with Neighborhood of Good was to think about how do we actually show people the good that happens on every order, you know, because it's easy to take for granted whether you're a dasher or a merchant or a customer that this is just like an ordinary transaction. But when you actually talk to the people inside this ecosystem, you start to realize that this is like much more profound, you know. So we'll talk to dashers who will say they're having an extraordinary day because like they're delivering through our Project Dash project that's bringing food to like immunocompromised seniors or homebound people. I mean, this becomes like a lifeline for them. Or you think about the fact that, you know, on every order, you know, you might get an amazing salad, but your dash is getting an earning and the merchant you order from is growing their business. So we really wanted to start to capture like, there's this flywheel that happens. There's this thing that happens every time you make an order where, you know, we're a multi-sided marketplace. And I think historically, we haven't talked as much about the dasher and merchant sides of the business, except in discrete ways. So this was an opportunity to really start to tell the story of like, What's happening from each perspective? If you're a dasher, what does it mean to dash on DoorDash? Well, it means you get to have an earning, but it also means you get to play a critical role um, in supporting your community, whether it's on things like Project Dash or even on regular deliveries. If you talk to dashers during the pandemic, they would tell you that they felt like superheroes. They felt like they were critical um, you know, infrastructure to keeping the world moving in that moment. Um, and our merchant partners also play a very similar role where many of them over and above the orders that they do on DoorDash or on Uber Eats or frankly on any of these platforms play a critical role in like how they showed up in the pandemic for their communities. You know, so Sylvia's, which is a great restaurant in Harlem, um, what they were doing was like they became a beacon of like this is where people could go if they didn't have food and Sylvia's was going to feed them. So you start to see all these amazing stories of how these different parts of the ecosystem are supporting each other. Um, and accelerating communities. And that's what we really wanted to, to bring to the fore, you know, to, to give you some stats on this. You know, last year we had uh, over six, six million dashes earn over $11 billion mm -hmm. right through our platform. We, we generated uh, more than $30 billion in sales for our merchant partners. Um, and so it's like, how do we actually start to contextualize that and help people understand that all of this is income, it's money, it's um, stuff that's actually flowing back to the neighborhoods that all of us live in and that we all have a role to play in that. When I do this podcast, at the end, I always ask my guests like you questions about what, what they care about the most. If they could donate to any cause, what is that one cause? And everyone, almost everyone says food insecurity for kids, especially when they're out of school. The pandemic was brutal. Absolutely. Without that school lunch, you know, those kids. So I think business people care. But it's cool to see that a CMO is so involved in something that, you know, generally the CMO, their job is to generate customers, not to make the world a better place. But that seems to be shifting. Yeah, look, I, I, I think the way I think about this is like, look, my job, let's let's not kid ourselves. My job is also to, to generate customers, right? Like <laughs> like mar right, right, mar right. marketing, marketing exists to, to drive um, outcomes for the business. But I think how you choose to do it and the way that you choose to show up matters a great deal. So going back to your example about school lunches and kids, like one of the things that I'd say I'm proudest of at DoorDash is the product Dash program that we built to specifically address issues like that. Because one of the things that's fascinating and frankly sad about the problem of food insecurity is that it has nothing to do with the amount of food that exists. Right. It's a supply and logistics problem. There's plenty of food that gets thrown out and yet there's plenty of people that go hungry. So you sort of have to figure out, like, how do you connect the dots between, like, where the food is and where the people are? And we've built this thing working with partners like the United Way and using our logistics infrastructure to start to connect some of those dots. Um, 
And a big part of the work we did during the pandemic was exactly that. It was like, how do we get school kids their school lunches, even though they're no longer in school? Because that's actually a benefit that's provided to them by the government. So like, how do we actually get it to them, um, even though they're no longer going in? And so being able to leverage our business in that way, um, for us, yes, it's doing good, but it's also, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier was like not thinking of these things as like a side hustle as like a social good exercise. Like when you think of our business, our business does better when we drive more orders through our business. So like even being able to work with partners like the United Way is great for society, but it's also good for our business. And we always want to find ways to do those things, because if you don't, you actually never scale these things to be material if it's something you're doing on the side. But if it's core to your business, because we've built this logistics infrastructure and we want to use it in service of this particular cohort and this particular audience, then you can scale that to be really meaningful because we're completely invested in it as a business. How much of your time would you say you dedicate to these? I know you don't like the phrase social causes, but like if we could just look at like the pie of your schedule, which is a very busy schedule, like how do you make time for, like you said, creating customers? It sounds like you know, spend a lot of time thinking about your dashers. Then you've got yep. this other work that you're doing, the social good work. How, like, how do you how do you make your schedule work to be able to do it all? Yeah, I mean, this, 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 this if I if I if I had a, if I had an answer for that, I would uh, you know I'd be I'd be more well rested. Um, no, look, I, I don't. I think one of the things that helps us, or lo- at least helps me, is like in general, we don't treat these things as separate exercises, right? So we're talking about this neighborhood of good campaign. We're not thinking of that as something that's completely separate. Um, was like a social good campaign that's completely separate from how we go to market. That is how we're going to market over the next six months. So it doesn't end up being like extra work. It just ends up being work that really highlights all of these things that we do as a business. But frankly, more importantly, highlights the work that the audiences in our communities do. Because like the point of neighborhood of good is not that like DoorDash is creating this. It's that like people in their neighborhoods are creating like these amazing things and, and driving these sort of like positive outcomes. It's like when you make an order, good things happen. When a dasher delivers an order, good things happen. When a restaurant ships out an order, good things happen. So we, we're trying to do this in a way where we're not trying to trade off brand for performance or trade off social good for like customers. We believe generally that like in this moment, like being able to be a company that's about these things and where it's core to your business should also be good for business. Right. Right. And when I think about your company and your product, it's interesting because you've worked at on Nike, you've worked at Bacardi, you know, you've done these consumer businesses, but you're building a platform. It's an app. You have access to pretty much almost every person in America and other countries too. So you, you are in literally in their hand and that's a lot of pressure. So with that responsibility, with that pressure and all these things that you care about, how do you even begin to build that user interface, that user experience um, when there's already a lot going on in the app? Yeah, it's a a great question. I don't think we've like cracked this all the time Um, because, you know, generally you have like lots of different parties that you're trying to support. But like the thing that you really want to solve for is like, as people come to me, am I doing the job that they hired me for you know so like when when a when a dasher opens their app the number one thing they want to see is like are there orders nearby Mm -hmm. so like are we doing the job of making sure that like when they when they're seeing an app are they getting orders that's like the first job and then if they're getting orders then it's like what types of orders are those are those orders that they're interested in doing or are they not that's like the second job so and fundamentally they're doing this because they want like flexible earnings and they they want to do this on their own time and the average dasher spends five hours a week doing this so like in those five hours we have to solve the thing that they came to us for and i think for each audience that's the question you're asking which is like why are people coming so on the consumer side like if i'm coming to doordash am i coming for restaurant food how do i make sure that that's what you're seeing am i coming because i'm looking to send a gift how do i make it easy for you to discover that um you know when you're logging in how do we remove the friction so I don't think we've completely like answered these questions all the time, but I think all we try to do is always ask the question like, are we solving the job that you came here for, that you came to hire us for? And how do we make that the most front of mind thing for you when you open this thing? 
I would imagine a big part of your job as you're talking about this is the data, is looking at that data every day and seeing what exactly what you're talking about. Are you hitting the mark? Are customers Correct. able to achieve what they want? Are dashers able to do their job? Do they have the tools yep. they need to do their job? Yep. I know our audience is dying to see your data dashboard and what that would look like. Are you able to so paint many, a picture at so all? So many data, so many data, so many data dashboards. Look, we we run this business on like a set of like key metrics that exist across all of our audiences, right? So like on dashes, we might look at things like dasher earnings. We might look at dasher hours to understand engagement. We look at that week over week to understand is that going up or down. You know, we did this um, this thing where we we provided gas benefits to dashes when the gas prices spiked and we okay. did that for months past our competitors so we understand like are they taking advantage of those of that benefit that we provide how many dashes are signing up for this benefit how is it showing up and how they're using it um what feedback are we hearing from them about the benefits so we're looking at all sorts of data um, on the consumer side we're looking at everything from you know new customers to how often they're coming back but also to things that are like quality metrics right so when you think about how many substitutions are happening on a grocery order? How often do we see like an item not found? How, how often do we have 20 minute lateness? Like these are like quality metrics about like the actual customer experience. So how, and then we will have goals around like, how do we make those metrics better over time? Because the last thing we want is a customer waiting for 30 minutes past when we told them their food would be delivered or having their food delivered and not having, you know, your fries or your drink or, you know, you ordered a bunch of things from Safeway, but only half of them came. And so we have entire metrics around all of those things, and we're tracking all of them off the, all the time. The other thing I'll say is there's also things that are like you learn from the data that you weren't looking for that then end up being like an inspiration for a new product. So one of the things we learned from our data was like there's a bunch of people who are ordering and then going on to order again in the next 10 minutes. Like that's like a really interesting behavior, right? Because like what that says is like maybe I came to order a restaurant meal, but like then I realized, ooh, I would actually also like some dessert. So I'm going to come back in and order dessert again. Or, ooh, actually, I'd like a coffee. Or like, I actually want two things, but they're not from the same restaurant. So I'm going to make two different orders. So then we built a product called Double Dash, which mm -hmm. basically took that learning and then layered on top of it an affordability benefit that says, hey, we're going to show you all the stores that are in range. We're going to bash that order with, with the Dasher. And so if you order within the next 10 minutes, you can literally go from like, I've ordered my salad and now i want to grab a coffee from x place um to go with it right so thinking about what do you learn from behavior and then how do you build products um that deliver on that behavior is, is another way that we use the data kofi would you agree that we are living and working in the experience economy and if we are is doordash part of that a hundred percent i mean i i would say that i fully agree that we're in the experience economy i think i think our product in a lot of ways is like highly experiential because like what you're really talking about, it's easy to look at things like DoorDash and think of it as like an app and it's a technology layer, but like underneath that is like logistics and people going from point A to point B to point C and interfacing with, you know, the technology at the, at the, at the restaurant. And if you think about like, how do we actually like be able to do deliveries while maintaining the in-house experience, right? Cause if the last thing a restaurant wants is like a bunch of orders loaded up, Dash is not picking them, or people in the hallway when their customers can't get in. So you end up with right. all of these things that are like, at every step of this thing, you're thinking about how do I optimize the experience for that customer? So how do we make sure like restaurants are getting the best experience? How do we make sure Dash is having the best experience? How do we make sure the customers are having the best experience? So I would say like, we think of ourselves very much as an experiential brand. And because we have so many touches with people in the real world, making that experience as great as it can be, um, is 100% one of the things that we focus on. You know, going back to your example of example I shared earlier around things like 20 minutes lateness. Like, if you order a pair of jeans and they show up a day later, like you're not like super pissed about it. <laughs> if you if you order right. your food, if you order Friday night dinner and it doesn't show up for 30 minutes, that's a terrible experience. I mean, I have little kids, so if the waiter, if we're out to dinner and we don't bring the food first for the kids, I'm like, do they? What? Come do you on. not understand? I have little kids, so I'm like, do you not understand that they need to be fed immediately? 
<laughs> it's rough out there. It's rough. Um, well, that's great. Well, it's so cool to hear about all the cool things you're doing as DoorDash's first CMO in the Neighborhood for Good campaign. It's always refreshing to hear about business people that are passionate about helping the world because there's no shortage of problems. Uh, our audience want to get to know you a little bit better. So we need to do the rapid fire round. Are you game Let's go. to answer Let's some go. questions? Let's go. Right. I will take all the questions. All right. What did you eat for breakfast today? Ooh, Fruit Loops. Wow. That's I can't believe I, fruit I just loops. shared that. That's I, amazing. I know. Wow. I you... know. So, so, so context here is that like the first, at Leo Burnett, the first business I worked on was Kellogg's. Ah. And so, and so that, and the first brand I ever worked on was Fruit Loops and Frosted Flakes. So they have been a part of my life ever since. Wow, you did a good job. I think everyone they would just associate that with childhood. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm trying to stay young out here. <laughs> um, what's your idea of perfect happiness? Oh my God! Wow, that's a hard question. My idea of perfect happiness. Um, probably just contentment. So me, um, my wife, our kids, a handful of close friends, um, on a beach somewhere for days at a time, um, with no kind of no plans to go anywhere and with opportunities to like run away from my kids for parts <laughs> of that time. Uh, Which yeah, if, you I have, mean, if you have young kids, you appreciate. Yeah, we, we, I had a baby. You said March of 2020. Every time someone says that, I think I was eight months pregnant that time. <laughs> what a time to be, what a time to be having a baby. Yeah, no, it, 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 but you know what? It, it's, we're going to have another conversation about having <laughs> little kids in a pandemic and what that yes. is like. Um, that's a, the whole thing. That's a whole thing. Okay, Kofi, what is your most embarrassing work moment? Ooh, most embarrassing work moment. Early on in my career, I did the cardinal faux pas of being on a conference call and thinking I was I was on mute when I was not and and, and cussing someone out who was on the call. So that was fun. Oh, wow, that's pretty good. That's a good one. <laughs> my boss, my boss at the time was wonderful and she went to Staples and bought the easy button. You remember that thing? Oh no. Staples had this like Staples the whole thing was like this is easy. And so they had like a button, which just giant button that just said easy on it and you would push on it. And she bought that and the creative team mocked it up to say mute instead of, <laughs> instead of easy. And they put it on my desk. So I would always remember to, to, to hit the mute button. That's a very good one. Yeah. All right. What is one mental strategy for managing hard days? Uh, mental strategy for managing hard days. Um, I lean into sort of like gratitude. Um, so like I try to remember when I'm having a hard day that like, you know, 17 year old Kofi who was like waiting to see if he could, if a college would give him a full ride so he could afford to go to the States, um, would have thought that was a ha hard day and he would just giggle at, wh at whatever my expression of whatever hard day I was having is. And then the other thing is like, you know, I use, I use like music as a tool. So I've got like a bunch of like songs that are like my you know my pick me up like go to's mm -hmm. for, for hard days that's great that's great if you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive who would it be uh robert nesta marley bob marley I'm obsessed with him okay I, i've never heard him called that by his name like robert that's it that, yep. that, yeah um if you and then there's the music thing that you you could correct you could do correct. music with him too you could listen to him play music okay yeah, exactly if you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what would it be? Outlook, um, joy, grit, kindness. Love it. And lastly, if you had one billion dollars, what would you do with oh it? Oh my first? god! What would you do if with I, it first? What would I do with it first? Yes. Wow. I mean, that's so much money. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, could, you could give all of it away and still have a lot. Um, I, so I, because of, because of where I grew up, um, because of my path to this place, like one of the, the ideas that I think about a lot, which in a lot of ways is why like I'm stoked about a lot of what we're doing at DoorDash, is this notion of access. And like, I think access is like a really powerful idea. It's about like, how do you, how do you open doors um, for people like me who, who needed doors open for them? And so if I had a billion dollars, that's how I would think about deploying. And I also like to say that like all roads lead back to Africa, lead back to Ghana. So I would think about 
like how might I be able to like take some of that money and think about like what are the most important like development projects that you would focus something like that on? That's probably where I would start. Well, this has been so fun. I hope you will come back. Maybe next year. I would, I would love to come back. Whenever you have me, I'll be back. All right, awesome. We can hear more about all the good things you're doing in the world and at DoorDash. If people want to learn more about you or even order from DoorDash if they've never done so, how can they do that? I mean, if, <laughs> definitely don't worry about me, but like, you know, <laughs> www.doordash.com. Super easy. Go to the site, download the app. Um, you know, there's lots of opportunities to get involved with this business. Um, and, you know, we're, we're huge fans of the communities that we operate in, which is sort of why we're indexing our, our next campaign around this. So lo love hearing from uh, people that are part of our community, um, even when, you know, the things they have to say, like I'll get people hit, hit up on LinkedIn with the, with the support ticket saying my order went horribly wrong. And I'll be like, cool, I will look it up. I will fix it. Wow. I, will call you, I will call you personally and find out what happened and... Like we, we want to hear from everyone about everything um, because this business touches so many people. Well, that is very generous of you. Everybody, you are tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Thank you for listening. Until next time.